I'd like to introduce uh, Atsushi Iriki as uh, our next speaker. Um, I have known Atsushi since 2006, when he attended one of the first workshops we organized with Paralimes on something with brains. I forgot what the title of the workshop was. It was chaired by Jean-Pierre Changer, and there were a lot of very interesting. I think Stan Thielen was there also, actually. So there was a lot of very interesting people. And somewhere along that line, in that two or three days, I don't know how many days it was, um, workshop, Atsushi came to me and said, I want to do something like this in Japan. <laughs> and so we got into a discussion and we not only uh, in that workshop, we uh, Atsushi <laughs> came many times to Europe and then mostly when he was in Europe, he visited uh, Amsterdam and we had dinner in the or lunch in the uh, first class restaurant of the uh, of the national and in Nederland's Spoorwegen, the Dutch Spoor the railways. <laughs> Uh, and so we, there grew a very nice friendship in which uh, the, the, uh, I got to appreciate a lot more about, actually I got to appreciate for the first time that in the East and the West, Japan being the East and Holland being the West, <laughs> uh, that there are some real basic differences that are very interesting, they're very interesting to, uh, to, uh, to explore. And that led to, led to the point a lot later in 2016 that um, Matsushi was one of the key speakers in uh, a conference that we organized east of west, west of east. And so was Andrew, actually, who uh, uh, will talk after uh, Atsushi. So I can give you a whole list of <laughs> things that Atsushi has accomplished in his life. I don't think it's... Uh, that is what you're interested to hear. You're interested to hear the story now. So I would very much like to introduce Atsushi uh, to give his talk. Thanks, Jan, for introduction. And I'm trained as a cognitive neuroscientist. And I heard a lot of interesting story through this conference. And many touched on to the illusion of control and the phenomena that how it looks like and how it came about. But as an experimentalist, mm -hmm. I would like to focus on how that kind of illusion came about and why it came about in human brain to find out the mechanisms, mostly based on my own studies, but try to elaborate the mechanism of it. And at a at the latter part of my talk, I would like to extend further by extrapolating from the current situation we are now to how to tackle this problem to control the issue. And I have not there yet, that, but this is what I'm doing. And I would like to share with you the idea how to tackle this problem, how to solve this problem. And potentially, I hope it could be solved. And I can tell you in a few years, but anyway. About evolution, looking back to a million years ago from now, this is a function of the brain size or cranial capacity that can house a brain and as a function of the millions of years ago from now. And this yellow lineage shows the Australopithecus lineage or ape men, whose brain size is slightly getting larger along the history, but within the range of the extant apes or chimpanzees or gorilla. It's not much bigger than that. But there's one point in the history when Homo lineage appeared, the brain expansion accelerated much faster than the natural selection allows. And this is a time, I'm briefly skimmed through it later, <clears throat> when the homo lineage started using tools and some kind of phase transition happened <clears throat> underlying the mechanisms of our operation of our brain. And next stage, and this brain size peaked in the Neanderthals or Heisel Heidelberg man, <clears throat> but not 
getting larger after that, or rather shrunk. There's range of that, so it, it cannot be completely exclusively, but at least it's not getting bigger any longer. But the question here is proposed as a sapient paradox, is that nothing happened for like <laughs> 200,000 200, years after Homo sapiens appeared. So nothing interesting happened, but suddenly some kind of things happened. And more recently, like 5,000 or 50,000 years ago, suddenly the civilization started to emerge. And what was Homo sapiens was doing for most of the period of its existence and suddenly changed the shift only recently. And this is called proposed as a sapient paradox, but it's actually just a puzzle of hominid evolution. And the real paradox come in as a result of this puzzle that, that included or involved, involved some paradoxical phenomena within our brain and our intelligence and thereby in our society. I get back to this point in the last part of the talk. <clears throat> so what happened at this point when Homo sapiens started using two? As an experimenter, I try to find out the concrete mechanism behind it and started to train the monkeys to use tools. Now, this is a Japanese monkeys, Japanese or Japanese macaque. And they are usually not using tools and believed not to use the tool until I show this. But as an experimentalist, I trained them to use tools and also like a video game like this. And this was rather easy for them to be trained. It took like two weeks or 10 days. It's much shorter than it was believed. Mm. And their brain was ready to do that. But they don't do that because it's not necessary in their wild habitat. But they have capability to do that. Mm. I, I call it latent capability. The scientists hate this idea, but, but, but anyway, let's go to this point later. But with after the training or accompanying training, I don't want to put this causality in here because I, I'm come to this point later again. It's not the linear causality, but this training or acquisition of the ability accompanies <laughs> with the changes in the neural response property. Again, I'm not, I cannot get into detail. I have not had time for that. But I recorded the neuron, uh, neural or nerve cells from the brain area called parietal cortex with side of brain where the tactile or touch information and visual information merges. <coughs> and, and this is a cartoon diagram showing the so-called receptive field of these neurons. Uh, this green one shows that this neuron responds to the touch of the hand. And the red sign shows that this neuron responds when something approaches the monkey's hand. And this neuron produces action potential or fires mm -hmm. when visually see mm -hmm. that happens. So this is called as a body image. And this phenomenon has been known. It's not this phenomenon in the neurons, but the fact that the patient with parietal cortex damage lose the body image. This was known for a long time, 100 years. The body image means like if you go through the narrow slit like this, you bend your uh, body so that it can go through. It's a visual image projected onto the, onto the space. Or if you go under the low gate, you bend your uh, head. If you're wearing a hat with a feather like this, you bend your head so that the feather doesn't hit. So that means that body image can extend to the artificial thing that attached to your body, like tubes. And after 100 years, observing those clinical phenomena. I think I was the first one who discovered that actually the neurons in this parietal cortex change <laughs> their response property so that the tool can be incorporated in the body image or alternatively, body <clears throat> image can be extended to the tip of the tool. And also this kind of neural responses <clears throat> were projected onto the video monitor too. That's why we are crazy about the video games. We can project ourselves in the monitor. And there's many other things that came after this. But the important thing oh, it's already shown here, I recognize later is that 
intentionality, any actions that we perform in the wild or natural habitats have intentions, or we reason this as an intention later, it's the kind of post addiction that if we're approaching this, I intend to take this. But this intention is very abstract and there's no material. And it can disappear or it emerges and disappears while you are doing something, but it cannot be shared or seen by anybody else. But if the tool comes into the game, that is the previous expression of the intention. And your abstract thought is materialized and this is not gone and it can be shared with others and it stays forever and like this the information can be shared and transmitted spatially and temporally in a long range of the time and space so this is the kind of information that authentically called dna i don't like to call it dna but the information that's contribute to the evolutionary, evolutionary mechanisms. <clears throat> and this was not recognized at the beginning. And after I, I have observed this uh, neural response property changes <clears throat> by the training or accompanying the training, after the technology emerged, it's called voxel-based morphometry, and detected that brain actually expand during the training period, just, uh, just a two, 10 days or two weeks, as much as 23% in this magneto resonance signal. And that's a great amount of the brain expansion in relative to the short period of time. And we could detect this in monkeys because monkey never used to before. And this is a brand new uh, ability that mon monkeys acquired and brain responded to that. And the expanded area correspond to, corresponded to the area that have actually expanded during evolution. And I met the, since the neural resources for processing the information expand, I call it metaphorically neural niche construction. And niches are resources from the environment that contribute to your survival species. Mm -hmm. That's the original meaning. But this, I call this neural niche construction. And what is this expanded area on the brain is doing? I did a meta-analysis for uh, hundreds of existing functional MRI studies and detected that essentially this area combines the tactile or somewhat sensory information and visual information in relation to the 3D space. So therefore, the arboreal <clears throat> animals like monkeys who live in the 3D space unlike the rats living in the 2D space, this area expand. So basically this is area to process the spatial information in the physical space. But after expanded in the humans, this is an area attributed as a brain area responsible for processing various information in the form of the spatial information processing, like a temporal space, uh, there's no clock here, but we regard the time as kind of the space, have a direction or amount, and there's a logic. Combine the concept, there's some underlying concept or bridge the concept or <coughs> social hierarchy. There's top down or <coughs> basis, but there are all the informations are processed in the form of the space. This is a tendency of the human brain across any culture. This is a fundamental, again, the latent capability. And since this brain area is devoted to the monkeys living in the forest, it was expanded first. But afterwards, it was, can be useful for processing other kinds of information in a similar way of processing. So this is, again, the latent capability, but it was unpredicted. It's happened to be useful for something. I think Brian, our author, uh, explained yesterday about the Apollo 15 story. It was using the gadget, you know, completely useless things for the immediate demand. So nature is designed that way, unpredictable, but you can post predict it and explain it afterwards in the, some reason, in the causality, but it's <laughs> illusion. And I called it the niche, cognitive niche construction because it creates <clears throat> a new 
new cognitive capacity or capabilities. And that's, again, metaphorical cognitive niche. And combining this neural and cognitive niche, our ancestors started using many tools and started embedding the environment and modify the environment, like Jan has at the beginning told us about the niche construction of beavers. And beavers, so we are built in that this way. But the difference between beavers and humans is that beavers are satisfied with this initial niche construction and monopolize them, and that's it. But humans keep or wishing for better and better and more comfortable and more, more wealthier kinds of niches. <laughs> and by the intentionality to increase it, humans as a primate habitat, which is a tropical area, expanded to the older world to comprise the current Anthropocene. And this was directed by intentionality. And this is the original concept of the ecological niche construction. And once we expanded our area and adapt to those area, brain expands again and the cognitive niches uh, expand again. So I called it triadic niche construction. And in here, what I showed in the experiment is just a learning capacity or a, a plasticity of the brain within the lifetime. But I, and this cannot be alone be a evolution mechanism because there's nothing superficially, it's seemingly nothing mm -hmm. transferred to the next generation. But if you think about like the tools, extra genomic information can be shared and transferred to the next generation. It can be the extra genomic or epigenetic mechanisms that came about recent years. Mm -hmm. So the gene or gene genetic mutations is not the cause of evolution. In this scheme, they are the result of evolution to note or memorize the changes. And there's many theory about this sub, but I don't explain in detail on this. But in this way, I propose a triadic niche construction. And this was like a phase transition added to the previous Australopithecus brain into the homo lineage brain. Therefore, it accelerated brain expansion towards certain direction, which was directed by intentionality of our human ancestors. <clears throat> this was the first transition happened in the homo lineages. And before getting into that, why the trans, uh, triad niche construction is possible is the fact based on the fact about the characteristic of the primate brain. This is an evolutionary trait of the mammals from the 250 millions ago on now on. And if you look at the numbers here, this is the number of the species in those mammalian order. And from, you, from here, you can see that primates and rodents and bats are the most successful species in the <coughs> mammalian order. And if you think about what kind of modality or information, sensor information they live on, is that primates live on the vision mostly. There are also there are so many other five, five modalities. And rodents mostly rely on odors, smell, and also tactile information about whiskers, and that on echolocation and on the hearing auditions. Therefore, their brain is adapted to evolve most efficiently to process those information. There must be fundamental differences of the design principle of the brain. And if you compare the rodents and primates, and there are various kinds of uh, various size of the brain in each order, like a Terry I've just shown in, the, in this morning. And like a capybara, it's a big rat of uh, 90 kilograms, live in the same environment with a squirrel monkey, but much smaller brain. And if you compare these brain with primates and rodents, uh, these colored air areas are called uh, primary sensory areas. The red is tactile the touch, <clears throat> and the blue is vision, and the yellow is audition, hearing. But if you compare the rodent brains, the big brains are just the inflation of the small brain. <clears throat> and, if you, and the primate brain, if you compare the different sides of the brain of the different primates, Indeed, primary sensory areas expand a little bit because their body size become bigger. 
but most increased areas of white area is called association areas. And this was a kind of a new area or modified version of the original area that add the new functions. And it's not shown here, but if you compare the number of the neurons, <laughs> the same size of the primate brain have like three times more than the rodent brain. And if you compare with the elephant, which is a very distant order, elephant have like twice the size of the human brain, but their not neural number is like half of us. So primates have a principally, principally different design principle for the brain, how do it work? And this is like latent capacities. And this is notorious. If you had told, told this, it's everybody thinks that it's, it's not a teleology. Evolution is not aiming for something, but this is called exaptation or pre-adaptation. There must be a reason. I don't, I don't know, and I don't get into the detail of this reason why primates have this design, but it's good for something. And it's adapted for that purposes, but happen to be used for other purposes when encountered other conditions. And this is called pre-adaptation or mm -hmm. exaptation. This is not anything like a teleology, <laughs> but it prepares the latent capabilities in many fragmental bits of things. And nobody is expected to be combined later or develop further in the later, but it's just there. And because of this, the primate can go through the triad niche construction and phase transition to expand speed up the brain expansion. But it peaked at Neanderthals and it didn't peak, uh, it didn't expand afterwards at all, at least. But our cultural evolution have farther speeded up. Why can this happen? And there must be some another mechanistic or substantial <laughs> mechanism, but probably in the same principle. And here, my assumption was that this, and I think it's almost proved, is that I separated in the triadic niche, niche construction in two phases. In the initial phase, each brain area responsible for <clears throat> one domain of the cognitive capability is called domain-specific intelligence, expanded by this triadic niche construction loop, one by one, independently. They don't talk with each other. But at <clears throat> some point, brain stopped expanding. And after that, there's many reasons why the brain didn't expand. There's many nu nutri uh, nutrition reason or like a birth canal, it's limited to brain size, but there's many uh, reasons for that, but I don't know what it is. But anyway, it stopped expanding. But it's kind of such oversaturated in the brain. Oversaturation means if, uh, if the water can solve, it, solve the many materials like a salt or sugar, we can oversaturate it that. But if once some stimuli happens, it's suddenly crystallized. Or if you get in the bath, the hot, hot bath, the gas uh, uh, solution uh, dissolved on the, on the gas is much lower in the higher temperature. So if you get in the bath, it's a bubble come about. That's an oversaturation. And it's come suddenly <laughs> crystallizing. And like that, brain was oversaturated with expanded triadic expansion. And once, once some trigger happens, it starts interconnecting with each other. <laughs> and it actually happens. There's a global network in the brain. And completely different domain start interacting with each other, creating the called domain general intelligence in the cognitive psychology, uh, evolutionary psychology, they call it domain <clears throat> general intelligence. And in, under this scheme, this, this is a latent capabilities. We are ready for something else to be combined later, and it's actually happening. And in the first phase of triadic niche construction, the governing rule is physical and the function, similar function, that, because that is a domain specific function. And what is the rule for domain general intelligence to happen? They start connecting a completely different domain of the things. There's no reason to connect it, but it's start connected. And therefore we acquired domain general or more flexible intelligence. The rule here is called stimulus equivalence. 
And this is a rule that this is an example of the language, but it's because it's the e most easiest to explain. Looking at this animal in any different culture, it's assigned a different sound depends on the English or French or German and complete different sounds, but it's pointing the same thing. And if you train with this same uh, sounds to point this, it can be trained. And if you train this, uh, train somebody, if you see this, to spell out this, this can be trained. And in those <coughs> individuals, if you hear this sound, immediately spell this. This is a theory rule, and this is very logical. <coughs> and you can train the animal this quite easily. But the characteristic of human is that if one is trained A to B logic, people tend to immediately repeat the reverse logic. This is called symmetry. And this is very illogical. And, but it's natural for humans. That's why any culture in the world have a saying that reverse is not true, so you have to be careful. But you, should, you, can, you, should, uh, you, are not, you don't have to tell them to the animal because they never do this because it, it's illogical, it's dangerous. But if you, and if you combine this terrorism and present C, automatically retweets A. So this completely different domain of the information, sound, reality, and characters, or visual one, are combined, linked with each other, <coughs> and form the same concept. This is a basis of the concept formation or categorization, and also the uh, basis for language as well. And I did experiment, not using language, but more abstract symbols, to train this theorism and this uh, logical symmetry and equivalence, and find out that this was <clears> observed <throat> by the global network of the brain, very much resemble to the language related areas. So comparing the first and second phase of the triadic niche construction, the first phase is very long, and second phase is very short. But if you co compare the components of this, how it can be realized is that the cost of the first phase is actually the materialistic, more protein, more brain areas, more enzymes, and so on. You have to devote much resources on it. So it's costly time, but the cost for the phase two is just rewiring of the existing things. And in the animal development, stage of the brain, all the areas are connected. And it was this connection, was this, uh, use this connection is discarded, this is called pruning. So this uh, uh, rewiring can be induced by just suppressing existing function. The cost is very low. Therefore, phase one, the speed is low, and phase two, speed is very high. And therefore, In the phase one, like a homo lineages get out of Africa, it get very slowly. And it has to be cost efficient. So it, once it is useless, <laughs> it shrinks back. So it's reversible. So that's why, although it's much higher, it's, uh, much faster than the natural selection, the speed of during the homo lineage, the speed of expansion of the brain is <laughs> rather <laughs> slow during this millions of years. But after Homo sapiens started to rewiring this, this didn't happen until it was oversaturated for the first 200,000 uh, 200, years of Homo sapiens history. But for some reasons, we don't know that exactly what triggered it. When it started happening, it's very rapid. And since this is very low cost, cheap, and it can be shared immediately by, through language <coughs> and can transfer, which is called culture, mm -hmm. it becomes irreversible and directed toward one direction and it will be irre irreversible. Therefore, it's very fast. And this is how our civilization have been evolved. And also, once it has started happening, it's spread very fast across the globe and with the interaction with each other, independently emerges the kind of civilization as a, the structure with what we call civilization in different area part of the world. And the puzzle that civilization almost happened, started to emerge uh, at the same time, simultaneously, 
but independently. Or by that, they look so similar. Although there are differences between, uh, between the civilization, depends on the environment, <laughs> but they are similar. If that is because the pre-adapted latent capabilities were identical. So combination is identical, and therefore it looks similar. And I thought this explains many of the puzzles that human civilization, how it was emerged. So it was basis of language. Therefore, here is the origin of the illusion of the control. So language have a syntactic structure. And language forms a concept by connecting different <clears throat> things, but reducing or ignoring other information that I was interested in. So it's extract the linear causal structure. To transfer to other people, we have to express in language. This is very useful, but it's also have a dark side as well. We tends to, or we have to explain or understand the causal structure through language and explain to others. So we have, have, have to have a linear structure that matches the language syntax. And therefore we have start having an illusion that we can control things in a linear position. But it's not true. And this was reflected or projected onto the classical computer, computer gating. The computer gate, classical computer gate, I'm going to come to this later, is that they are comprised of four gates, and, land, not, nor. So this is a linguistic causal structure, and it's explicit to our mental capacity of understanding things. And we think we understood when we could explain in language as a linear causal structure, which is an illusion. It's, this simplicity is an illusion of a complexity of the real world. <clears throat> and more stretching out my theory to the civilization and culture. <coughs> we talked about uh, triadic niche construction phase one and two in uh, single brain now. The principle is that everything has to get larger, bigger, grow. So we cannot escape from the concept of the growth, economic or politics, whatever, have to grow and bigger. Otherwise we cannot survive. If we abandon that, we are no longer primates. We become rat like rats. But this structure can be expanded to more individual or community or civilization. Like thinking about our globalism now, this was a connect interconnection of individual culture in, in individual area used to be. And in, 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 within this individual area, the community was individually incubated as interconnected. So it's kind of fractal structure to explain the time dependent changes or evolution or development or history of the, any kind of humanities and society, extending from individual to the global civilization that we are facing. Mm -hmm. And here, this is governed by the sense of control, which can be the illusion. And next stage of my talk is going to expand specul uh, my speculation into the next stage to think about how this human, how this structure of the causation expand to explain our global civilization. Again, I would like to base, put a foot ground on my own experimental data. So I will extract a part of it, but I think it's universal or general, can be generalized to many of our uh, characteristics. So think about the human habitat. We are primates. So the primates <laughs> are tropical animals, but as I told you before, we expanded our niches to cover most of the part of the globe. And this is very unusual for animals, any animals on the earth. The primates are tropical animals. This represents a tropical zone. And for the non-human animals, we, we heard about a, a possible habitat uh, whose talk was it. It was, I think it was used. 
but the humans are very unusual animals that extend to outside the original habitat. And this is impossible or almost illegal for other animals. Because think about bears. There are three kinds of, at least, three kinds of species on the bears, black bear, brown bear, polar bear. If you map their habitat, they exactly correspond to the climate zone. So this means that <clears throat> if one species expand out of their original habitat, this major speciation ha uh, uh, is induced and becomes a different species. And human being the, one of the primates, expanding out of the original habitat is violating the biological law. We may <laughs> say that we are modifying the environment to match our, our tendency, but it's very unusual and very strange. How can this happen? Probably non-human animals never ever imagine to go out of the original habitat because it's uncomfortable and it's fatal. But humans mm -hmm. are doing that. Again, come back to my original uh, data is that I told you before that brain expands when <laughs> trying to use tools. I didn't mention too much, but I had been talking about the two areas on A and B. And that was actually the area that expanded during the evolution. But area C, this is called secondary somatosensory area. And this has been a mysterious area for a long time. And until now, other than me, probably don't know what is the function of this. There are many theories vaguely, but we recently detected that this area is smart sense area. So deal with a body, a body tactile sensation but more devoted to relate the structure of the environment with your own body or structure your own body to place them in the structure of the environment. And there's many experimental <clears throat> details about that, but I don't get into that. Uh, but I call it uh, in, in the primary somatosensory area, probably many know that there are structure of the brain called body map. The body is part of the body, it's represented in the brain. But in the S2, so secondary small sensory area, I named it body map. It's not body map, but self in the body map. And this is one latent capabilities that primates have acquired. And also, in this, uh, in more recently, we discovered in this secondary small sensory area. <laughs> the neurons that are sensitive to yourself in the mirror. Behaviorally, monkeys, I believe, cannot recognize themselves in the mirror. It's called mirror self-recognition. And this has been believed, but the neurons can recognize, but cannot, but it's just not ex exhibited in the behavior. So there's no proof of the behavior or evidence that they can do that but there are latent capability of the neural structure that allow them to, uh, to recognize that or exhibit the behavior when environmental condition allows. And since there are two examples at least, there must be more of those, these examples. So in this way, just with a body map, we just recognize the animals can recognize your body <laughs> placed into your own environment. The some of the animal can relate, them, relate themselves with the environment, like migrating birds. They can travel long distance, probably guiding the structure of the stars, but in the geometrical manner. This, the example of the Sama Triangle comprises of three stars, Vega, Altai, and Denev. And referring to like this, like sailors do, can navigate themselves into the world. Now, this is a self in the world map. And this more developed version of this can be represented in the secondary solar center area. But again, inviting the ability of the symmetry or equivalence, the other side of the self in the world map implies the world around the self map. You reason or may, uh, put on or project the <clears throat> meaning around yourself. 
And this is another impossible function for non-human animals. But with this, what we uh, humans start doing is that draw a constellation of figures in space. And more so, also started to make stories. Like in uh, our Eastern culture, we have a story that Biga represent the princess and Altai represent the shepherd boy. And they fell in love and they happened to place across the Milky Way or we call it a uh, silver river. And there's a story of the love story that they encounter only once on, in, in, in the summer, right? Well, anyway, they make up we may start to make up story that for the unreachable location in the space. And we project the meaning of that. And therefore, we started dreaming to beyond the horizon and curious about what is there. A non-human animal will never be interested or don't recognize that such an unknown world exists. And this function probably, start, uh, this corresponds to the original a uh, crude version of this correspond to what uh, von Yukusku have proposed called the Umwelt or environment. He proposed that this Noya Kreis, which are new circuit that go reverse from the output to input to project some understanding of the environment. But by the brain expansion, it expanded the self. This correspond to, in the phenomenology, it's called uh, phenomenological reduction, it's called intentional arc or explicit projection to the world to project the meaning onto the <coughs> symbolic world that comprised in our brain, uh, established in the brain and projected on the outside world. How this started to happen? Probably, this is my guess or my speculation out of my data, is that probably happened when the monkeys start using tool by sitting. To, to sit to use tools, our body axis become vertical. We cannot sit horizontally. And this is a dramatic change. The people often say that the human became intelligent because they stood up and started by totally commercial free the hands and do many things. But before that, as a pre-adaptation of latent capability, monkeys start sitting. And this is a dramatic change I said, is that in and any, many of the animals after Cambodian explosion have a symmetric body design, except for jellyfish or starfish. They have a, you know, uh, it, it has a point symmetric design, but most of the animals have symmetric body design because it can move rapidly. And in this symmetric body design, the animals move along the direction mm -hmm. of the body axis. So the brain is designed or adapted through the evolution to manage the spatial information in this coordinate system. And if you stand up, it pressurizes a lot, unusual pressure for the brain to process the information to rotate the world. And that pressure is the secondary small sensor, sensory area. And what happens after that is that the body axis become vertical and the important thing about this is that we start acquire, uh, it's the intention becomes vertical to the body axis. And in this way, we start acquiring the eye to establish a meta self recognition or third person view of yourself in relation to the world structure. And more importantly, <laughs> with this eye view, we can see the standpoint or on the ground ourselves on the foot a monkey can see a monkey can see their sitting position but this is very unusual for any animals no animals can see their standing position or center of the gravity of their own body holding in the space so this makes us recognize the origin of the world and in this, in this way we can recognize the horizon and can recognize something exists beyond the horizon, meaning knowing unknown. And this kind of perspective, world perspective, is completely different from what we call bird view. In, in the English word, I think we, we 
call it bird view, but it's different from bird view. In our, our culture, we have different Chinese character. In the bird view, the center of the gravity or the lift that, that supports their body is in the air, and they cannot see their own center of the gravity or any animals. In any animal have a vertical uh, symmetrical body design move along the body axis. The ground is just a limitation of the space that they can move around. It's not the basis of the world or origin of the world. The same for the fish. Fish can see the sea surface, but it's just a limitation of their space. And the animals <coughs> walk in the 2D space. They can see the ground, but they cannot see the, the origin. Therefore, the world beyond the horizon does not exist for them. It's only humans that know that unknown exist and start naming that for the unknowns. And if you know that unknown exists, you want to be there. And therefore, we start expanding our habitat beyond the horizon with the intentionality. And with this structure, start explaining with language, we think that this can control, controllable, and this structure must be comprised of the linear causal structures. And this is again, is a result of illusion or causal illusion, I don't know, but it's not true. So then switch a gear to the final stage of my talk. I'm now conducting the research with archeologists and anthropologists with the humanities sectors to started to combine this concept of the neuroscience or natural sciences. And what we have been doing is to take up the expand the idea of triadic niche construction to further larger scale. What we are doing is that in the humanities sectors, they collect samples or data. And they try to explain with the theories of ours. And the natural scientists have a theory and try to demonstrate our theories, but never merges. Probably you have a similar experience. This have a high hurdle to overcome to merge them. There's something <coughs> gap in between, which probably is an illusion of control. And reason for that is there are latent capabilities that archaeologists or anthropologists cannot never find that they are exhibited, but they are capacity to exhibit it. And without combining those latent or unexhibited component of the causal structure, it never reaches the truth behind it. And the reason for this probably is that data people or humanity people go for uniqueness and the natural science go for general generalizability. But again, if you think about where is it unique is that it is unique among the whole, but it's general within the boundary condition. So this is a gap. And without taking into account this latent capabilities or different kinds of combinations or different paths, we cannot reach the real complexity of the real world. And the language is completely important of doing that. And what is a then what is a means to describe this complex causal structure, which is not linear, but more parallel and superimposed in the probabilistic way. And here at the final stage of my talk is that what, how can we make the means to control this illusion? And this is from now on, the story is ongoing. And this is I just share with you what I am attempting and I don't have a result yet. I cannot say at this point that it's either true or not, but I believe it's true. And then here comes the quantum computing and the path into Bell. You know, uh, I think somebody touched on to the quantum uh, theory earlier as a metaphor. But for, to, to, to formulate the quantum theory, there are three ways to do that. One is Heisenberg's matrix, uh, matrix uh, uh, uncertainty. 
no, no, it's, to describe uncertainty is called um, matrix mechanics. And Shurajinga, Shurajinga has proposed a wave function. And third way is Feynman's path integral. And this is proved to be interchangeable or it's, it's intertranslatable. It's I, saying the identical thing in a three different way. And I think in this, the Feynman's path integral is most equivalent to uh, what we're thinking. The, uh, met metaphorically, the reason is that, think about the evolution we have been talking about. There are many components to evolve from previous stage to next stage. For the uh, human evolution, there are many components like tool use, language, fire, cooking, the group size, X, Y, Z, many <coughs> things. And there's always a story to elaborate or describe the linear causation. And if one starts saying that, there's always ex exception or alternative possibilities and arguments stop there. But if you think about a path integral in the quantum theory as a principle, it's not, this is not the quantum phenomenon, but it's just analogy and principle, there can be many paths. And if you assume or, or, or print as a premise, you assume many latent capabilities can be combined in any way or combined in any order, there can be many paths to derive from this stage to other stage. And path integral says, that in, in the classical uh, mechanics, from go from <coughs> here to here, there's only one path governed by least action principle. But with a quantum computing, there can be many multiple paths superimposed by each other as a possibility map. And once one, one is observed, the other disappear. But it's called wave packet contraction. There's a mechanism behind it. And, and this classical mechanics and uh, quantum mechanics can be interchangeable actually by called Koopman von Neumann classical mechanics uh, uh, equations. So classical mechanics, the single causality is just analogy of the complex system behind it. So picking into this as analogy is instead of a classical gate, that's it's have a linear <laughs> causation, you can install quantum gate. And there are many possibilities to describe the quantum gate, depends on the condition. It's, this is showing just an example, but it's described. This is impossible to describe in our natural language, but is, we are now applying the means to describe it in the quantum, combination with the quantum gate or quantum algorithm. And the, this quantum computing uh, principle have been around for 30 years, but it has never developed until recently. And we now have the prototype of the quantum computers. And uh, Rick and our institute have just launched uh, last month the 128 qubits or quantum bits quantum computer. And actually this kind of small size of computer is useless for the usage that people are assuming like cryptography or, or uh, uh, for, uh, it's with my English, optimization problem or whatever. <clears throat> they need, much larger size and also error correction algorithm, probably for the ones who are not familiar with it. Computers make errors. So what we uh, usually do in the classical computing is run the three identical program at the same time and take a majority board for each steps. And that can correct errors. Therefore we can rely on the result. But in the quantum computing, it's all you know, different. The probabilistic superimposed. And there's some error correction algorithm now, but I think it's too far to make it realize. But <coughs> even with this small size quantum computer, it's actually, I can use it for free now, is that <laughs> it's good enough for proof of concept studies to describe the principle behind this complex behavior that people are not aware of before. And this is still at a stage of analogy but in the cognitive, new, uh, cognitive science, there's a uh, major, uh, large amount of studies is com, uh, com, uh, studying on how the analogy works. A typical example is a mental leap, the book called the Mental Leap. And the important thing is written small in here, which is analogy in creative thoughts. So still this is at the analogical stage, but with this proof of concept studies, I think this is a new way to describe <coughs> the complexity of real phenomena 
that the human discarded or ignored to understand by our natural languages, which allow only the linear causation or simplicity or analogy as a, a simplicity as analogy of a complex world. And this path integral also have a fractal structure. And if you compare, I, I told you about this one stage of the progression of the stages, but the world are combined with multiple stages and it can be diverged forever, but there are environmental constraints. So it, it does not allow anything to happen, but there are some constraints in each stages. And further, if you combine this, it can be constrained by environmental constraints. There are impossible things that happen, uh, or that exist in the world. Therefore, collectively, it looks like linear causation. Therefore, to explain it, we make a linear narratives. Therefore, we regard the world as a simple causal structure <coughs> that can be described by language. And this is a source, a reason for illusion, is my proposal. But with the path integral theory, we now have a means to describe and also calculate this complexity behind, you know, these are crowd of the possibilities, crowd of the paths. Some of them we can detect the evidence, <clears throat> some of them we cannot, but there exist a possibility. And it's a cloud of probabilistic causation with com quantum computation, we can describe the world. This is my proposal, my gut feeling, and that now what I am working now. And this is just a just sum up this cartoon figure, how this triad initial construction realized in my own personal history. <clears throat> The world developed by intentionality in a very probabilistic and ambiguous way, but there are some tendencies. If you talk about a Tokyo when I was born, a little bit after I was born, this is center of Tokyo is called Shibuya area. It's just flat. It's nothing like now. But at the same time, probably there are many of our, our generation, we have a cartoon called Jetsons. And the world there was like this. And I thought it was impossible. And we call that this kind of the vehicle air car. And it was like six, uh, how many years? Nearly, nearly <laughs> 60 years ago. And I thought it's impossible. But uh, 30 years later in Odaiba in Tokyo, they start building these kind of things. Probably architects grew up seeing this cartoon, start designing this. It's different, but similar, isn't it? <laughs> and now what is happening now all over the world in Shanghai, Doha, in Singapore, the building very much looks like jet suns. Mm -hmm. And even the drone taxi, like air car, exists and playing around. And it's not a single causal path, but, uh, but it's a kind of intentionally driven complex path, but constrained into some possibility band. And our culture or, or world evolved in this way. So. I, uh, I explained that this kind of wall structure in relation to our own body drives our expansion of civilization. But within this structure, we assume the linear, linguistically explainable or natural language-like causal structure, which is controllable. But we now know that the illusion and we have a means to describe that this is a kind of a complex structure. And we have a now having start having the means to describe it. And we have a, if we have a means, there must be the way to control it. I doubt it. But we have how, how sort of tame it or manage it. And it's not an illusion. I think it is really is a paradox induced by the second phase of niche construction that incorporated the paradox of simplicity and complexity of the real world and our brain capacity. So therefore, probably the subject or conclusion of this symposium would be look for the means to tame or manage the difficulty, seemingly the paradox, but it's a necessity deriving from our path of our intellectual evolution. Thank you.
<laughs> Maybe you now understand why I did not want to say anything about uh, yes, past. <laughs> the present is much more interesting. Is there anybody with questions? I can't, it's difficult for me to see you. I, I see you, but, and I see you. Okay, we have a good start. You're the first one. Okay. Very uh, fascinating presentation. Um, I, I think one little part of what you're saying is uh, illusion of control is part of the human condition. So we, we, we shouldn't get too worked up about, uh, we need to get rid of the illusion we, we let, want. Let it um, be, the word of wisdom. Right, exactly. So, um, however, um, I think it's common sense that there is something like more illusion of control and less illusion of control in, in real life. Um, and my question is, you know, illusion obviously has something to do with the concept of perception and misperception. Um, and my, my question is, can, can you, within the framework you, you're working with, can you explain uh, the difference between uh, perception and misperception and how one in, in the real world might practically work on reducing the misperception, thereby reducing the illusion part, even though we know we, we can't get rid of the illusion or we, we can't get rid of all misperception, mm. but again, there's more and less. So. I think it's just a matter of degree of the subject, in the subject, what you're dealing with. And I'm not saying that everything is complex and everything is not simple, but there are complexity and simplicity it depends on the subject you're dealing with. And also, with, although within the complex causal network, there always are node that all the causal, causal path merges. So the extreme molecular reductionism were very much successful in detecting those nodes. There are some genes very critical can control many symptoms or phenomena. That's good, but not everything can be explained by reduced gene. There are genetic networks and epigenetic factors, many other factors <clears throat> that cannot be cannot fall in that category. So molecular reductionism works in the subject that can be reduced in very simple causes <clears throat> and can detect, maybe can detect single node that is the knack of those complex structure. In that sense, it's controllable. We think it's controllable in that aspect, but there's many things that is uncontrollable. So it's just a matter of degree and what are you are looking at and in what, which degree you become satisfied with yourself or a society becomes satisfied. So there's no linear straightforward answer to anything, but there are something that can be done. And I think those th simple things are almost exhausting in this world. They're so successful that we are constrained by the, our success story, our history of it. And that's our limitation. Yes, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, I really enjoyed the way you en enlarged the vision and the dimension throughout your talk, actually. I mean, you started out with a very simplistic way, like a very um, objective way of using a tool and then ended up in quantum theory. And um, it was uh, very impressive. And actually it made me think about, um, whether you can come up with something. <laughs> so a straightforward linear answer. <laughs> this person has not possible. Um, but is there kind of a training or tool you could think of that could actually help people um, be capable of um, grasping more dimensions or thinking in a quantum theory style or something like that? I mean, we, we've had this idea that well, AI, AI is uh, so complex, nobody can understand it. And today Terry said, well, it's just math, you know, it's just multidimensional math, but it is. And so 
okay, you then you say, well, probably <laughs> at least some are able thinking like that. Um, but then you can say, okay, how can we actually, or how can we enable more people of us um, in may maybe a very straightforward manner, like the mechanism using the tool, um, like a very practical manner to be able to actually grasp multidimensional things. Well, I think that is a power analogy that has been analyzed in the great depth in the cognitive science. How the analogy helps you to make a mental leap. And you look into this, there are many examples of that. And how to utilize, how to use analogy, mm. convince yourself or convince society. I think that's a way that the currently only way we have. But looking into that field of discipline, what they propose to do is to, to create the suite or semi-abstract illusory space elsewhere and project the current complex state onto that reduced or increased dimension map space and calculate there and project back onto this space. This is how you use analogy to link the different things mm -hmm. and com computerize or, or formalize in, in a mental way. And in this semi-abstract space elsewhere, ideal space, probably to date now, it's projected onto the multi, uh, multi-dimensional scaffold of, this, of, the, of the mathematics. But quantum computer can deal with the space, which includes the ideal number dimension, and also the quantum phenomena that include the Planck constant. And that we cannot understand or pre perceive, but we have a means to calculate there. And if you project back, then make us understandable. Mm. And we did that so far using analogy and discrete narrative to describe it in the cognitive psychology. But we now have a means to actually calculate that and try to understand through the translation of our natural languages. I think this is one possibility. And another thing, slant, that can be useful, I thought, is that I thought you will ask the past dependency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the answer that side. <laughs> is that probably you're asking past dependency because you're interested in the phenomena or state and how the past, how the idea or concept of past emerges from the interest on the phenomena and how it develops. And this is the past. But in this theory, in, in this concept, there are multiple paths superimposing each other. And the phenomena is just an intermediate expression of the state of the path. So the phenomena doesn't exist. The path is. So if you're interested in the path, and actually there's a theory in evolution that now the Darwinian theory, evolutional theory, interested in the phenotype and natural selection is hypothesized to select the phenotype or phenotype a group of the phenotypes, which is a species. But if you're interested in the path, there can be multiple potential paths in the, in the course of evolution by combination of many factors. Evolution may be selecting the path. So this is not path dependent, but phenomena dependent path. <laughs> and this is just a, a switching the way of the, your interest or your way of thinking. And our natural language allow us to only become interested in the phenomena or stable state or path. We name it as a concept. But that, that's a limitation of our natural language. But if you are, have a described way to me, uh, describe path and become interested in the path itself, that's dealing with the same thing, but it gives you a completely different perspective. And that might help. And this was the answer prepared for your expected question, but <laughs> I made a question. After three days, we figured out the path. It's a popular uh, reaction. <laughs> yes, uh, if I may ask, thank you so much for the talk. I'm really stimulated, and there's things that are coming together in my mind, particularly illusion of control, level of granularity, and agency. So I just want to share one thought and I have a specific question. Um, I see an analogy in thermodynamics where statistical mechanics was used 
to calculate you know exchange of momentum between atoms whatever at aggregate level we come to a thermodynamic notion of pressure it's an illusion of control to think that i'm going to influence the movement of an atom but i can do something with the pressure and i have agency again at the higher level of granularity so my question now is do you have any examples where the cloud of probabilistic causation can be used through calculation but where I can understand at a higher level of granularity where I have an agency and I'm referring to the what people call the adjacent possible which is of course largely uh, written about in the complexity science so what could complexity calculations do in the cloud of probabilistic causation and what does it tell me at a higher level of granularity where I can have agency again to identify uh, well, the immediate adjacent. answer to that is uh, information of thermodynamics okay. dealing with uh, Demon of that's of demon, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's information thermodynamics mm -hmm. and can kind of interchangeable with information and energy. And that's one example that mm -hmm. I don't know how to connect it, but it's some kind of similarity. Mm -hmm. And more in the macro scale scope level, as you said, in the quantum theory, can be theorized by statistical uh, physics because they can repeat millions of zillions of attempts, trials, and describe it statistically. But with interest in single photon or single particle, we cannot describe that. Then switch a gear to the history or, or evolution. You cannot repeat millions of times. It happens once it happens, and, and other, other possibilities shrinks. But probably the principle behind it can be identical. So there must be the ways to formalize the least example quantum mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and we don't know yet, but there must be a common ways to describe it. That's why I'm interested in proof of concept study using quantum computing. So I don't know yet, but hopefully I will know in a few months. <laughs> you let it go. I'm optimistic. <laughs> we have a, we have a question from the yeah. from the cloud to say and then start here. Uh, from Victor, uh, Victor Galat. I'm curious to hear your insights about how digital technologies and not just technology in general might be affecting the evolution of the human brain. Can we see any tangible physical evidence of such changes? Or should we view these technologies simply as an extension of our abilities and tools to expand our niche? I don't know. I don't know, but I that triggers my imagination. Is that we heard about the chat GPT and a, a large scale language models. And that's AI. The, Mathematics behind AI is very simple and straightforward. It's just a matter of the amount of the data and the quality of the data. So it's just a business, it's not a science itself. But the thing I can trigger my thought is that what if those AI start manipulating the quantum theories? So they can manage any kind of information, now the language, but can easily extend to the visual information or auditions or molecular information. That can be done. The mathematics behind it is very simple. And with a good amount and quality of a data set, they can do that. And then once connected to the quantum computing, they can start managing the quantum world and respond to us with the answers that we can never understand by natural language. Mm -hmm. So unless we create the translator to do that, it's very scary, but it's very much plausible. And I'm optimistic that humans can, can come up with those ideas. But that's, this way of thinking shows that possibility, open that possibility that's unseen before. But we can see that because we can see the ground, we can see the horizon, and we can admit that the world beyond the horizon exists. So we can, with the imagination and predictions and power of the human brain, I am not so worried. <laughs> I, 
you shouldn't, you don't have to be worried if you start worrying far in advance. Well prepared. It's like a self defense army. <laughs> be prepared and trained to for the future crisis. Then you don't have to worry about it. That's my, you know, it's a slightly <laughs> shift answer, but anything other than I cannot say. So, future is unpredictable. Yeah, for me, the prime example of the illusion of control is driving a bike in Amsterdam. Because there are hundreds of bikes, no one cares about traffic light, and you have to follow, you, go through. Uh, and the reason I'm saying so is that this requires a combination of a lot of sensory input, um, motor activity, you have to steer among the, and you have to make the prediction uh, where to go, and you have to, you have to predict your own action, but also make a prediction of all what the others are doing and i'm now going back to at the beginning of your presentation where you showed differences between the structure of the brain of primates and rodents and i was wondering whether you illustrated that there's these additional connections in the primates whether that you can relate that to uh, diff, uh enhanced behavioral properties um and in relation to that, uh, studies on neuroimaging have shown that the human brain can be in multiple states. So you go from one state to another. And I was wondering whether uh, you, you, you made single unit recording, so it's pretty hard, but whether fMRI might help you to find those traces in the brain that correspond to the, 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 the paths uh, that you described in your in your, in your uh, your presentation. I hope I could, but I don't know yet. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. But the question to you is that is there a smart city program can manage the automatic driving of bicycle in Amsterdam? Yeah. It can be controllable and can be describable by current modern code of computer. Yeah. Yes. Well, I also make also make a connection to the presentation by Tarasinovsky this morning. Who had several levels mm -hmm. and what you show is that mm -hmm. actually by going from rodents to primates you get additional layers additional connections mm -hmm. and that might give insight in how the brain works what you can gain if you have additional levels and what you can gain if you have uh, the connections mm -hmm. reflection to that a slightly different thought that i, I that inspired me is that in the multi-layer machine learning, the mathematics behind it is very simple and straightforward. Yeah. But nobody knows actually what is happening in the layers. And it's undescribable. Yeah. It, it can do it only. So this I think corresponds to what the West is describing about their knowledge and civilization, and what East is describing knowledge and civilization. To transmit the wisdom and knowledge, it can have to describing the text and we can we have to describe the text and let the descendants read it and then transfer the information but in in the eastern way like uh Rumi, i think we have talked about that a lot it's very ambiguous and unreliable we think at the western things and superstitious and in many ways describing it but the thing is that it has been around for thousands of years and it's actually working and what is working is that they cannot or we cannot transmit the content explicitly, but we can transmit explicitly how to how the how to how to let the individual descendant individual acquire them by themselves, the way of training, way of spirituality, the environment, and so on. And they have acquired that with their own enlightenment. It's not the Western Enlightenment, it's personal enlightenment. So that is known and established. But it's similar to multi-layered machine learning. We know how to how to for, for the how to how the machine to learn it by amount of data, quality of data, how to feed the machine the data. That's a means to, but it's never describe the content. Yeah. And I think this is a two different way of describing or transmitting information yeah. to the next generation, thereby forming the culture. Yeah. So, well, in this way, 
is presenting east and west. It's not necessary to say so, but this is a two way of describing the same thing and just a perspective difference. Like, like if you are interested in phenomena or past, it's the same thing, but by the interest, it appears very different to me. And probably the automatic driver of bicycle Armstrong cannot be coded in the classical computer code, but can but the machine can learn how to deal yeah. with it. Yeah. It's like a contrast between Leibniz and Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> Newton, yeah. Newton and Confucius. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just going to ask a question that may hark back to the earlier one about suggestions for ways of teaching these capabilities. Maybe it works forward to the next presentation as well, but I'm um, I, I'm I'm working a lot with open learning, open research, open educational resources right now, and I'm doing that with younger software developers. Most of them using Ruby. Most of them using actually Japanese origin coding systems combined with React front ends to build platforms, which allow us more easily to provide interactive data tools for collaborative learning and collaborative storytelling or case study creation. So my question is, and, and it riffs on the digital outcomes for the human brain question, are we living an era in which the linearity of narrative, far more so than from post-structuralism actually, I mean, post-structuralism attacked the linearity of narrative and the authority of narrative, but today we're living in a world in which data sciences combined with software innovations and learning innovations is allowing us to manipulate stories as they're being told and choose, and choose our own adventures. We use this for ecological studies of complex ecosystems like wildlife. We have enormous data sets on the Serengeti over time and our case studies can allow learners to plug in tools using our shiny or Jupiter and, and really manipulate those data and see what might have happened for a given species under different kinds of environmental or other constraints. So is there a way in which that, do you see that in your work with folks in the humanities and your, you know, your current mode of expansive learning and teaching? Do you see open principles of open science and open learning, which say that deliverables are not static, nor are they individual, and perhaps they are less linear. Is this something you see as influential mm -hmm. and optimistic, or is it simply more of the same? Well, it's a, it's a bit detached from my talk per se, but uh, I think we have uh, can have a lot of lesson from history of the education system, mm -hmm. and especially in in this personal enlightenment story that I just talked. Mm -hmm. I, I think you are triggered by that conversation. Is exactly. That? There's always a two stages in like a teaching the Japanese traditional art or in a traditional uh, Japanese fencing or whatever. Mm -hmm. so any, any, anything. There's always two stages. And one, the first stage is, is like a textbook kind of style to, to transfer the fundamental knowledge or basis of that. That can be written in the textbook. The next stage. In, in any schools of those traditional martial arts or, uh, or performing arts or whatever, there's a secret book. And there's kind of uh, undisclosed book, which is transmitted only between one teacher and one student at one generation. And this secret book has been exposed like 100 years ago. So anybody can read it now, but it's totally chaos. It's totally saying, Op opposing things, but this is hidden secret because um, if the amateur or un untrained or less trained person read it, it falls in total chaos, but it's allowed to transmit only from one teacher to one person because they have interactions with each other and ways to how the students to enlighten themselves by the numbers of feedback between those. So you have to watch how they react and uh, predict how they react, how they thought. And you have to have a fine control of it. Otherwise, double-edged sword, it's harmful. So thereby it was hidden secret. 
but there's many explanation textbooks to how to discover the hidden secret, but it's not enough. So uh, what I, I can say at least at this stage is that the real core of the education is not for mass education system. Right. It needs some careful control. You have to choose a few things. And you don't have to teach everybody the high level, super level thing. If you do that, the world, again, can chaos. So I think so. I'm not an educator, so I, I'm not, don't know about the social situation and education system, but there are stages and the numbers, limited numbers of the proportion of the knowledge and skill to be acquired and how to stabilize all strategies. And that has to be carefully done. And not everything is appropriate for mass education system. That's my gut feeling. I'm not a professional, so I don't know if that's- No, it's very I, useful. It's very useful or not, response. But, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe political issue comes so far. No, not, not <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not a professional. There's another question from uh, the net. Yeah, from the and net. Then, sure. From Somia. Which latent capabilities in the human brain do you think can be unlocked by the advance of AI? And would specialization optimization here lead to more brightness of the system as we heard before? So it's latent, so it's unknown. <laughs> if you knew, it's not latent. <laughs> so I think that's a question that I cannot answer. Or, or I should not answer. <laughs> I, I, I can make a conversation over the wine or beer and gossip, but it's not the appropriate scholar's behavior in, in these public places. It must be private. I'm sorry, that's my response. Sean. Sure. Thank you very much. It's uh, the only thing that I feel I must criticize is your proposition that you're not an educator is entirely incorrect. <laughs> I want to ask a, a, a metaphorical question, but I think I'm it in the direction that you took. One part of it goes to something that Dan Brooks spoke to in the context of the human intentional implications of Darwinian evolution. And <clears throat> you made a remarkable observation which certainly changed one perspective of my thinking profoundly in your observation that one of the reasons or perhaps the reason why human species entered landscapes which were not in fact necessarily appropriate in respect of their occupation was perhaps because of an ability to perceive the unknown beyond the horizon, which necessarily therefore required exploration. And you related that, I think, to the concept of intentionality, which has certainly informed human behavior over millennia. Now that would have enormous implications for likely human behavior in decades and centuries ahead of us as we confront ecological challenges on multiple reasons and uh, multiple levels. The second thing related to that in a strange way was your reference to the Feynman path integral and the images that you projected shifting from Tokyo in the 50s. I, I think it's desperately important. I think it was a brilliant insight. Tokyo in the 50s out to, in a certain sense, modern Tokyo and then Dubai, Singapore and related areas. And you could have played with what Mohammed bin Salman is trying to do with Neon at the moment. <laughs> so in other words, everything that is beyond the present conceivable, which I suspect is related to the application of the Feynman path integral metaphor to the concept of the unknown and hence the intentionality of humans leveraging the fairly extraordinary level of, of consciousness that we have. If you then relate that to the breakthroughs that we are making, not only in generative AI, but in quantum, and in addition to that with the whole concept of digital twins and everything that is being evolved for the purpose of ecological observation, it would seem that the potential pathways that humans may feel encouraged to explore 
<clears throat> will expand exponentially given the additional technological capabilities that we will have. How are we going to handle it? How are we going to manage that? What, what? <laughs> so I use the term to tame it or manage it. It's not controlled. <laughs> but but so that allows the reserve to ambiguity. You've got both of them. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the, I think there are two components to your question. One thing is that where and how a human can expand looking for, for the locations or possibilities. And one is how to do that. And the easiest answer is to, to, to escape from the limitation of the expansion or growth belief is that to the cyberspace. Right. You know, that's we construct the uh, infinite amount of the dimension in the cyberspace. And I think that's the easiest answer. And people are doing that actually. And the means to do that is AI and everything like that. And there must be dangers and possibilities and so on. But that's everybody can discuss. And another another possibility is to the also extraterrestrial to the to the space and the universe. And it's seemingly it's impossible because even though we expand outside our natural uh, climate zone, it's on the Earth. So the most powerful limitation of gravity and uh, circadian rhythm and those physical constraints are identical. So we could do that. We, when we go to the state, those are completely different conditions. So the easy speculation is that if somebody were able to do that, it becomes a different species. But that's in our perspective, our constraint of imagination. Probably the ancient cavemen had a similar perspective for the beyond the ocean, the completely different condition. Maybe the, the humankind can solve the problem to solve the problem of gravity and tame the environment there gravity, circuit, rhythm, and, you know. So I'm not denying that. So that can be another potential possibility for the humans to expand. And I think there are many people trying to do that. And that's fine. And, uh, and the second part of the question, how and how to see the possibility. Again, the same thing. What could be the limitation? It can not expand infinitely. There are some constraints and limitations. And one thing useful for this is that even though we cannot predict exactly where to go and which way to go, but we can predict which will not be gone and which what shouldn't do. I think that's is more beneficial or useful. It's different from this story, but this, when I mentor the student, they use they always talk about a success story. Why, how did you success, succeed about this? What is the secret of success? I can tell you that, I tell those students, and uh, it's interesting and encouraging. This never repeats, you know, in any, who, who was a soldier, any in combat. The success tactics never works because it was done by different person in different occasions in different enemies. And it works only for once. So the success story is never repeatable. But when you lose, that is, repeatable, or there's a universal, I, I don't want to pre 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 preach the priest, but anyway, so in terms of the, the failure or um, um, impossible thing is more useful for the design of the future than what is can be done. So that's my vague answer to this. Right, that's where you are now in your quantum <laughs> so, Yes. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm, I, I'm, I'm correct in saying that the, there's no uh, necessary wins, but it's a uh, necessary losses. You learn more from failure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The last question for uh, Peter. Yeah, actually, um, the question I have, I, I picked up from the internet because I thought the last part of the last question was can, can AI cause also brittleness in the brain? I, I think it got lost in translation, but it kept me curious. Um, if artificial intelligence or IT in general 
can cause with this approach brittleness in the mind, in the brain, sort of cause decoherence or something like that. <laughs> what do you think? We have a reaction in that one. I need time. Sorry? I need time to yeah. respond. I, I'm sorry, I cannot have an immediate answer to that. No, of course, you are. Well, I Okay. <laughs> I'm yes. sorry. Yeah. I'm coffee. Yeah. <laughs> In that case, let's thank at the uh, Atsushi. <laughs>